Hello, I am Marcus Brandt, the head of mission of the International IDEA program for Myanmar, focusing on building federal democracy in Myanmar, working from outside of the country. Uh, and we're having a conversation today with one of the uh, most seasoned international experts working on Myanmar, Ambassador Leticia van den Asum from the Netherlands. Uh, you have served uh, in many bilateral functions as the ambassador to uh, Kenya, I think South Africa, Mexico, United Kingdom, uh, but also in Bangkok accredited to Myanmar uh, during a very interesting period, 1995 to 2000. Uh, and uh, following your retirement from national diplomatic service, you served in the UN uh, or UN related uh, Rakhine Commission mm -hmm. under uh, former Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan. Uh, and uh, ever since then, you have remained very active uh, as an interna leading international voice and expert on uh, Myanmar, especially focusing on Rakhine issues, but in particular after the coup also about uh, on democracy and uh, the restoration of legitimate government. Uh, we will talk today a little bit about the situation in Myanmar overall uh, since the coup. Uh, particularly the, the situation in Rakhine state, and we will touch upon the Rohingya issue. We will talk about international uh, accountability mechanisms, uh, justice uh, mechanisms, uh, and uh, we will um, see especially what this means for the prospects of the future development. Uh, you have recently spoken uh, to my friend Mansur Hassan also in a very good podcast that I recommend to everyone. Uh, and I want to build on some of the things you said there. Uh, but I first actually would like to start with a personal question, and that is um, what motivates you and how, what inspires you and what drives you and keeps you hopeful that the effort is worth it and that uh, your engagement will actually bear fruit? Thanks, you... thanks Marcus. And, and um, yes, I mean, it's... It surprises many people that I'm still at it, but but you have to realize that, you know, when I first uh, uh, came to the region in um, 1995, there um, already was a major problem with with the Rohingya, and um, who had only just returned from yet another round of 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 fleeing and returning, sort of the revolving door syndrome that they experienced for decades. And um, then, having had the opportunity, um, as you mentioned, uh, in 2016 and 17 to, to work with uh, Kofi Annan and, 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 and seven other uh, commissioners in the Rakhine Advisory Commission, um, and trying, you know, the best we could to come up with recommendations that, that really, and I still believe, believe in this, that if studied seriously and if discussed and implemented today could make a very meaningful dif difference to the situation, that, you know, it, it, it was a huge blow, not only for me, but I think also for the other members of the Commission, that the day after we presented our report to um, the President and uh, of, of Myanmar and to the state councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, that was on the, the 24th of August 2017, that, you know, literally hours later in the early morning of the 25th, um, a huge um, attack started, um, sparked by, 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 sparked by, um, Actions of the of 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 Rohingya act, of Rohingya activists, but responded to by by Myanmar's military in a manner that I mean, the world that astounded the world, that shocked the world profoundly. For days, when you saw these long lines of people walking into Bangladesh, Bangladesh, with the little possessions they had been able to salvage, that is something that that stays on your mind. And, and ever since I've been available um, to assist those who think I can contribute with, with, with their work to, to, to further um, the cause not only of the Rohingya, but more generally the cause of, 
of um, of, of of bringing about and reviving actually the dream of democracy for for Myanmar as a whole. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you know, there were more difficult um, times um, after 2017, particularly, of course, the, the coup that took place, that is now soon, um, three years ago, um, that, has much, that has profoundly changed the landscape of Myanmar and actually is also, you know, you always keep at looking at where, where is there hope. Mm -hmm. and I think what happened in Myanmar uh, since late, uh, since late um, October last year, 2023, when various, various um, members of, of, of the resistance um, joined together to, to launch attacks that, mm. that were totally unprecedented and that had mm -hmm. an enormous impact. First of all, on the people of Myanmar themselves, it gave them hope, but it also sort of generated new energy in the international mm -hmm, community. Mm -hmm. What is happening here? Did we get our analysis wrong? Mm. Is it actually possible to deal uh, um, uh, uh, blows to the military regime that, um, that, that can contribute to a profound change mm. in, 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 um, in Myanmar? Mm -hmm. so, so you're continuously looking at, at, at what is happening and having spent some time in Thailand over the past two months and speaking to many people uh, who are here in also in, in Chiang Mai and other places, uh, it's, it's, it's clear that there is hope, there mm. is a belief, there is a lot of thinking, there are discussions, heated discussions, difficult discussions mm. about how to move forward. Mm. To, so, to so profoundly change a country that for 80 years mm. has been subjected to 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 to, to very oppressive systems mm. is, is no small matter. Mm. You are one of those who regularly point out that the solution to the Rohingya suffering must be part of a larger yeah. change in Myanmar and yeah. a larger uh, change in the in the overall context uh, in which uh, Rakhine finds itself. Uh, this is also a message International Idea, for example, has repeatedly stated in the UN General Assembly when we have uh, uh, various discussions mm -hmm. on the Rohingya issues. Uh, I would like to, and you were talking about the sort of uh, late uh, days of uh, August uh, 2017, which have now become actually the, the day on which the genocidal acts uh, in Rakhine State are commemorated. And notably in uh, last year, even by the NUG itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to ask you what you think of the the changes that have taken place inside the the broader Myanmar context on how the Rohingya issue is now viewed from the Bamar majority, from the political leaders, from the NLD. Uh, because I think there has been a quite a remarkable uh, shifting in positions also. So how have you uh, experienced that? I, I I agree with you, and and it, it was encouraging that so soon after um, the coup, the NUG actually um, decided on a policy paper that outlined their approach to the Rohingya um, to the to the Rohingya crisis and how it might be involved. That was very fast. I don't think anyone had expected that. And later that was reinforced by the many messages that we were getting um, from, from various groups and from people who were meeting each other in the field as, as, as training as, 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 as soldiers or as member, or the members of the, the, the other movements that were there, that they were starting to realize that, hey, you know, um, now we know how the Rohingya felt. Uh, we, we now ourselves are bearing the brunt of the worst of the worst that 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 you know that is almost unthinkable that the military um, is is capable of, and that so 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 that's been very encouraging, and since then I think particularly last year in 2023, the NUG again reaffirmed uh, its policy, and it's also been saying that. Um, 
it 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 is working on a new um, um, citizenship policy, and I hope and that's actually something that is quite urgent, and not only for the Rohingya but for a much larger group of people in Myanmar, who 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 are badly affected by the by the 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 current uh, citizenship law of 1982. They've also been saying that they will scrap a number of ridiculous laws, the so-called four race and religion laws of 2014 and 2015, that are highly discriminatory and were actually adopted at the time when, by, by parliament at the time when the NLD, the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, already was representative in parliament but didn't have enough mm. votes to mm -hmm. stop it. Uh, but so, so things are happening. On the other hand, um, you know, we shouldn't just, we shouldn't think that it's going to be easy, mm. that, that from here on uh, everyone will accept the Rohingya. That's not the case. Um, attitudes, beliefs that have been instilled in young children who have been told, whether it's in Rakhine State or anywhere else, that don't deal with Muslims, just, it's not good for you. And otherwise, you know, Muslim kids being told, "Be careful," you know, th those people you don't you don't associate with them, not good for you. Mm. That has a profound impact on young minds, and um, it's 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 going to be very difficult um, to change that. And um, what the situation is in Rakhine, and how people there feel about what is going to happen um, over, over hopefully, you know, the coming years is not clear. We don't have any, I have not seen any good studies mm. about what the attitudes are. Mm. Um, and it's important to take into account that, you know, uh, from 2018, 2020, the Ukraine state, you know, uh, was at war. With, 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 with the military regime, there were, it was a, a very violent conflict in which many people suffered. There were huge numbers of IDPs. And, and so that is the Rohingya trauma. And it, it's absolutely clear that if you look at all these decades, the Rohingya bore the brunt of the violence that was meted out um, by, 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 the, by the successive military regimes, but others have suffered also. Mm. And what people remember, because you see the, 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 the enforced exodus of the Rohingya is, is, is six and a half years, seven years ago, is it? Seven, yeah. And um, it, it is, it, what is in people's mind in Rakhine State, those who, is, is, is pretty much the awful fighting that not only the Rohingya who were left there, mm. but also the other uh, communities, mm. the Rakhine in particular, ha had uh, during that during that period. Mm. So you're looking at at groups that have their individual traumas, mm. have joint trauma, and how can you deal with that? It, it you can you, in whatever is 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 being developed in people thinking about how to approach this, you have to look at the population as a whole. You cannot only look at, at, at the mm. Rohingya, although mm. their, their situation and their, their suffering is very specific. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as we know, there are cases in, uh, there are court cases about it being determined as a, as a genocide. Um, but you have to he that, that, that you have to find a way of healing people mm. together, and not much attention is being mm. paid to that yet. Mm. Because what we what's happened is that what has continued in Rakhine State up to today is a de facto apartheid state. Um, um, Rohingya live in, in 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 either enclosed villages or in 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 in, in the detention camps, you know, since since two thousand mm. around two thousand twelve, you know, that's mm. that's that that's that's twelve years, mm. and um, if people don't 
meet each other, if their kids don't go to school together, if mm. there are no contacts, if they don't, you know, uh, have joint experiences, how are you going to deal with mm. that? The important thing there is, you know, t there is that the situation with the total lack of freedom of movement for, for the Rohingya is probably qualifies as a crime against uh, against the Apartheid Convention, mm. of, as a crime against humanity of the Apartheid Convention, mm. which Myanmar has acceded to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is one of the first things that, if you look at what needs to be done, as soon as it's possible, that needs to be addressed is how can that be changed? Because the last thing I would want to suggest is that the groups that are currently fighting for the liberation of, 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 of Arakan are responsible for the apartheid situation. Mm. No, that, that, these were the successive military governments mm. who were to blame for that. Mm. But you have to think uh, uh, pretty fast about how can that be changed. Mm. And um, because it is the core, it, it, you, if, if nothing is, you have to, and you can't change it at once. You can't change people's mindset at mm. once. But you have to program to do that gradually to, so that people themselves decide what it means for them to be, to be um, of Rakhine State or of Arakan mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, they could weld mm. together. But it's, it's, it, 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 it hasn't been done. Mm. Usually, you know, when you have a situation like that, there is a there, you, transitional justice measures are put in place. In the case of, of Rakhine State, that has not happened. There have been some smallish efforts here and there, and, and, it, it's, it, and it's in, that, that, that has been important for individual groups, but there has no, no comprehensive effort has been made, mm. um, except in, rela in relation to international criminal accountability, mm. which is important, but not in relation to other justice measures, whether that is truth telling, truth commissions, mm. finding other ways of reconciling people, mm. um, local justice mechanisms that might have to be considered, etc. Mm. That, that, you know, mm. we were starting from scratch, basically. Mm. Leticia, I would like to take you up on some of these things that you just uh, mentioned. And I think it's very important to bear in mind that the solution to Rohingya return, Rohingya reintegration is not just a question for the national government. And you said yourself that you have the impression that the NUG, the union institutions, have actually moved quite a bit uh, on this issue. But the return to the homes of uh, where the Rohingya came from will, of course, be to Rakhine State. And it is the Rakhine State dimension that in the future decentralized federal union will be key for the Rohingya. So I would like to ask you about more about the, uh, the situation in Rakhine State itself, uh, and in particular the political dynamics with the Arakan movement that you mentioned, the Arakan independence aspirations or uh, ideas for confederation, the relations, the maybe complicated relations between the Arakan army, the Arakan movement, and the democratic national institutions, the NUG and others. Uh, we all remember uh, the uh, situation uh, in 2020 during the elections uh, when uh, the whole setup was very different from the rest of the country, actually, and that still has long-term repercussions nowadays. So how would you describe the, the, po the politics of Rakhine State internally, the efforts of the uh, Arakan movement to establish its own uh, autonomous institutions and their relations to what would be uh, sort of a Rohingya retur returnees uh, to live among them, as equal citizens of Myanmar, of Rakhine State, of Arakan State, or whatever it will be called. Yeah. So how, because you work uh, with them, you're more in touch with them. What is your take on that, uh, from that perspective? Well, you know, I, 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 I think that if you look at um, the Arakan army and its civilian branch, the, the United League of Arakan, um, they have, um, I think confirmed on, on various occasions that uh, 
they're prepared to talk about the return of the Rohingya. They've actually said to Bangladesh and and, and um, China, the group that were talking about it. Um, yes, we are willing to 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 talk about this. We'll give you our plans if you if you accept us as a key stakeholder. And and of course, you know um, that hand that stretched out hand has not been grasped grabbed by, by 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 the other side and unfortunately that is because the other side um has mostly looked at okay how can we quickly as fast as possible get a couple of thousand people put them in trucks and take them up to northern rakhine state and put them in camps that we that they are preparing there it was made basically only about the transfer of a number of people from one camp to another with perhaps a month full of rations so that they could survive but that was about it mm. as if i've understood it uh, properly and 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 i think I, I i think it's i think i think i have so um i have been surprised over the past couple of years since this has been happening that uh, in the international community there has been so little discussion about this not much has been said about you know the conditions that really need to, everyone says you know the condition you, you know the rohingya cannot be returned because the conditions are not in place and then you know uh, a number of conditions are are are, are mentioned they have, they have to be to go voluntarily they have to have citizenships and all their rights that it has to be a sustainable return. They have to need need to, to be be able to return to their old the old place the, the places where they used to live, etc. But no one has actually bothered to look at now how how can that be done? Mm. It, the discussion has been dominated by 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 Myanmar and and um, Bangladesh and China and and uh, the UN. UNHCR has, you know, constantly said this is not on. You know, the conditions are not in place, etc. But there hasn't been a great rush to try to help create these new kinds of conditions. So that 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 that's the first thing that needs to happen. Um, and once it does become possible, and 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 we don't know when when these conditions will be in place. I think it is important to first um, have a lot of different conversations. First of all, with the Rohingya who stayed behind, about 600,000 of them, in 2017, and who didn't cross the border into to, to Bangladesh, because the first thing, and probably the immediate most important thing, is to make sure that their conditions are improved and that you know they are being taken seriously. As, as as residents of um, of of Arakan, um, and that the, the the worst restrictions that that they have been suffering under for a long time are lifted, and I think one of the worst ones is the and an overriding one I mean, is the restrictions on freedom of movement, which which have led to. The relative, the relative, and deliberate isolation of the Rohingya community, and is actually probably in the eyes of many of the the the, um, the people in Rakhine State, uh, only you know perpetuated their fear of the other because that's what it is. It's a fear of the other, um, and you know that that fear that fear is mutual. And I've seen it in the eyes of both communities, the, the, the fear in the eyes of the Rohingya, but also the fear in the eyes of, of, of Rakhine, mm. who are afraid of the Rohingya, mm. whom they, they, they have been told are terrorists and terrible people. Um, so this is going to be very difficult um, to deal with. And, and, you know, I think there's reason to be grateful to Bangladesh for having hosted the Rohingya for a long time and and uh, even though you know the conditions that um, we now see in the camps in Bangladesh are leave a lot to be desired to say the least but 
in order to develop a sustainable return of the Rohingya communities and the, the resettlement also of the existing numbers of Rohingya that are there, is, is going to be a major uh, operation. Mm. You, you have to think of this more also probably as part of um, a larger effort uh, of, 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 say, five to ten years at least, uh, of, of what, where, where does Rakhine State or Arakan, if you want to call it that, where do people want to go? What is their future? Mm. And how do all these communities fit into that? So where do you see this going? What are the trends? Well, how, what are the chances for all these communities to be living together in, in peace and harmony in a federal state or under Myanmar or even a yeah. confederated unit? Because we I, I are. I think if 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 you look at um, what what the the leaders of the AA and the ULA have been saying, it's clear that they 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 this is what they want. They're committed to it, but they have so much on their plate that you know what comes first. For the moment, if you look at what's happening right now. Um, uh, the fighting in, in Rakhine State is worse than it probably has been in, 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 in over the last couple of years. Mm. There's little information, internet is cut off, but what we're getting is, is, is really uh, a very violent conflict on, on many, many different fronts. So, um, you, you, uh, I think, you know, um, it, it will be necessary to as quickly as possible, once it is possible, to to return a number, a limited number of Rohingya, and then not as guinea pigs, but but in a manner that that uh, that that to show and to try some approaches that are, are really needed. Mm. Because one thing is clear: you have you have um, the the, the Arakan Army and the United League of Arakan, their civilian branch, but these are fairly young people mm. who are more flexible, who are more used to, 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 to think in terms of, of, of diversity, um, although not all. But you also have an older class of people, the politicians of the last couple of decades, mm. The, the, the Arakan National Party, various other parties, which include some politicians who, who have been openly racist and who have openly uh, advocated for, uh, for violent campaigns against the Rohingya. They're still there. Mm. And, um, you know, and some of them, if you look at the, 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 the elections in, in, in 2020, some of them actually were elected, mm. even though, you know, what kind of state, the, the NLD government didn't allow mm. uh, elections in, 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 in all of the state, um, but various people have been elected mm. and they are now, they might now be claiming mm. that, that they have to be returned and they have a point, you mm. know, uh, if, if that is generally ex accepted that, you know, the elections took place and some people have, um, are in these positions. Mm. You'll have to deal with it, even though they were, the elections were based on a constitution that is totally undemocratic. That and, of course, the very discriminatory decision in 2015 to exclude the Rohingya yeah. from the yeah. water rolls, which yeah. excluded yeah. Rohingya, as we know very yeah. well, from the 2020 elections. Yeah. And that is, of course, the paradox after, in 2008 and 2010, the military had actually used Rohingya votes to exactly. uh, provide legitimacy to its own yeah. constitution and the first yeah. election yeah. Uh, based on the 2008 yeah. constitution. Yeah. So that is, And that has all been taken away. And we have been, of course, saying repeatedly that a return repatriation of the Rohingya to Rakhine also implies the full restoration of political rights yeah. and electoral rights. And so to imagine that future Arakan state or or uh, whatever entity it will be, will of course 
require, yeah. imply also a full political reintegration yeah. of the Rohingya community. Exactly. And that will create a very different dynamics, presumably, than what we see now. In the yes, state. because if you look at numbers, that is, of course, significant. You have uh, 600,000 in Rakhine State. You have getting close to 1 million in, in, in Bangladesh. Um, um, it's something that has to be looked at. But, and you have to look at against it. Uh, it. You have to also put it against the potential for economic development mm. in, 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 Rakhine, in, in Rakhine State. Um, with 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 the Chinese investment in 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 Chai Pu, with mm. Indian investment, with other interests mm. that are there, what kind? How can you gradually come to a situation that 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 um, that can sustain um, the population plus all of those? The current population, plus all of those who will return, mm -hmm. and you know, it's not only the Rohingya who, who would like to return. Since about 2015, a lot of uh, young Rakhine, particularly, have been leaving mm -hmm. um, to go to the jade mines, to go mm -hmm. to Thailand. They're everywhere, mm -hmm. and they, the Rakhine, the young people in Rakhine, were late in coming to outward migration. Mm -hmm. Because you know the, it, life was 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 relatively good for them, mm. but the oppression of the Rohingya, and particularly after two thousand twelve to two thousand eleven, when they were gradually driven into detention camps, mm. completely changed the division of labor mm. in 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 Rakhine State. Mm. Um, much of agriculture dependent on dependent on um, uh, Rohingya labor. Mm. You know, if you look at fisheries as well, you know, the, the, the boats were usually property of Rakhines, but the Rohingya took them out and, and, and to go fishing and to sell the fish. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were, there were divisions of labor mm -hmm. that, were, that were disrupted mm. abruptly, mm. and that led a lot of young people to, to, um, to leave. Will they come back? Mm. Um, will... Um, the development, say, in, in Sitwe related to Indian investment and in Chagpu related to Chinese um, uh, um, investment, lead to um, employment opportunities mm. for them. It, it's it's too it's it's too early to say. Many open questions. Huh? Yeah, I would like to also ask you about the you know something related to your hometown, The Hague, which is home to the two international courts that play a very important role in the debate around the Rakhine and uh, Myanmar, the uh, International Court of Justice uh, that uh, is, of course, uh, dealing with the uh, genocide case brought by the Gambia against Myanmar, and the International Criminal Court that has yet to start proper proceedings uh, in related to, uh, uh, to the situation in Rakhine. How do you see from your perspective as a, as a diplomat also uh, the the you know what is sometimes maybe a confusion between these two courts in terms of the, the the level of accountability they can bring, and also with regard to the representation of Myanmar at uh, at these courts or or let's say of who gets uh, to be held accountable in 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 the Hague, mm -hmm. so to say. So what is your what what have been well, the recent observations on this issue? I I I, I think that um, if you look at the International Court of Justice. Um, and the case of, of, of the Gambia against Myanmar uh, under the Genocide Convention, um, that is an interstate conflict. It is not a criminal uh, court case. Uh, it is one state party saying to the other, you have to account yourself for what happened um, against the Rohingya. Um, I think... Um, it has been slow because it started in 2018-19, yeah, and um, and um, but it is making it is it is making progress. What I find very difficult with the way the International Court of Justice works is that all of the paperwork that is exchanged between the parties and it's thousands of pages does not enter into the public domain. 
And that is, is, is really, it, it, it's not made public until after the end of the case. Present estimates have it that we might have um, by early uh, next year, so 2025, um, the final hearing that the court would organize uh, for the parties. And um, that would, again, put more information into into the public uh, into the public into the public domain um, but it's it's since then it's been it's been it's been fairly quiet you know it's happening but you don't see much movement and of course once the court has made up its mind and rules uh, and let's assume let's hope that they they find in favor of uh, the Gambia and established that genocide was committed, it's left right there. There are no immediate consequences, mm -hmm. except that the international community and others um, would probably um, take account of this in, in how they operate and work with uh, Myanmar. So how does this relate to the yeah. ICC and criminal yeah, yeah, accountability? Yeah, 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 but there was and another thing I wanted to mention first. but. Um, Yes, but 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 to to, to to go to the to the criminal court, the criminal court has been deadly slow. I mean, I I, I it, it 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 it's now uh, more than five five six years that they have been at it, um, and I know the court is understaffed and underfunded and all of that, but it seems. It's the court itself also, which is the master of its own agenda, mm. and it could have done more if if um, the prosecutor uh, and his staff uh, had set the right priorities. And this is a really important case. Mm. I hope I have no idea where things stand. Nobody does, but um, that that this will be the year two thousand twenty four when they will finally decide to issue some indictments. Mm. Because that is the very positive thing that the International Criminal Court can do. Mm. It decides, okay, now I have enough evidence mm. against specific people, mm -hmm. which means that specific names mm. would go out into the world mm. and would, uh, uh, and, 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 and people could be brought to trial. They know that they would have to stand trial, mm. which immediately, almost as we've seen with um, other major uh, leader mm. leaders um, who have been um, who, who have been indicted, uh, it's it's makes it very difficult mm. actually to move around the world and do business as mm. usual. Mm -hmm. But um, and I hope that that is underway. Mm. Um, but it's it's. I, I'm, I'm frankly disappointed mm. in, 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 the lack of, uh, in the lack of progress there. Mm. Leticia, we have to wrap it up uh, already. I would like to ask you at the end, uh, what more can the international community do to help Myanmar as a whole to achieve this goal of building a federal democracy that will be the precondition for uh, a lasting sustainable return of the Rohingya and the and the peaceful development in Rakhine State. What more would you like to see, you know, international organizations, uh, bilateral partner countries, diplomats do? Well, this is a very critical time right now. We're dealing uh, with a situation where it's obvious that things are changing in the country and that members of the international community have to be shaken out of their I wouldn't say their slumber because they've continued to follow it, but their belief that the situation in Myanmar has been similar for the past decades and that the current military regime is invincible. It's now been shown that it is not invincible and that with, with, with dedicated efforts, a lot of people inside Myanmar whether they're, they're politicians, whether they are academics, whether they are, uh, uh, whether they are, uh, have, have 
whether they are, have joined various of the armed groups, are all united in their belief that this is now possible. And this has led to a sense of much greater unison than I remember uh, over the past couple of years. But it needs support. It needs a lot of support. You do not reinvent um, a country and rebuild it into uh, you know, an inclusive federal democracy overnight. It, it, it takes a lot of work, but a lot of work getting people together in particular, having serious conversations, and trying to bring everyone on board. And that is not, 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 not easy to do in a country that is so diverse and where people for decades you know, haven't been, have, have been told that their own ethnicity is what matters most. Mm. And don't, don't, don't get me wrong, ethnicity is identity. It is extremely important. It needs to be cherished. It needs to be protected. But when it comes to building a, 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 a new inclusive federal system, that has to be based on equality mm. with a lot of space for diversity. Mm. And, and that, that is very difficult to do because you know, many people still seem to have the impression that now will be the, 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 uh, a big opportunity for, for their community to, 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 um, to take charge in different parts of the country. And yes, I mean, under certain circ uh, uh, the circumstances and structures that might be built which make that possible, but they have to be agreed first. And that is the big challenge that, that, that now lies ahead. The people of Myanmar will need time, a lot of time. Uh, you cannot build, build such a structure overnight mm. immediately. And that means that you know, the international community has to be prepared to stand by them, mm. not with them, but by them to support them mm. in what they want to do. Mm and give them the space uh, to, 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 um, to come together. It's a huge task. Mm. And, and it, it will not happen overnight. And it's particularly, I think, important that the, the neighboring countries also understand that this is going to take time and that you know, they have to to be uh, understanding of of these kinds of 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 the situation, and um, and really uh, work work with the, with with the people of Myanmar mm. to make all of this happen. But it's I have no idea what it's going to look like. Mm. No one does because it's a people driven it's a pe mm. Myanmar people driven and it has to be Myanmar people driven mm. process that can take a long time but, but the international community is quite likely to be impatient mm. and wants to know immediately mm. who's in charge you know what are the structures mm. how do we trade how we do do that that, that that you know that's understandable but 80 years is a long time mm. and and profound change is needed well, talking to you, it, for me, is always, uh, I learn a lot from you and it's also an inspiration and it's good to know that people like you are at it, are into, you know, supporting Myanmar in this big effort, in this mm -hmm. long-term effort. Uh, and I hope we will continue to have good conversations on this and are able to somehow muster enough international support that our friends in Myanmar need. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Leticia. Thank you. And thank you very much to the audience for watching us. Uh, we will uh, share some interesting links uh, for further reading uh, and we will certainly continue with this uh, series of uh, conversations on building federal democracy in Myanmar. Thank you.